Okay, wow, lots of weird camera stuff today. I don't know what's going on, but uh, yeah, this time uh, the, I'm going to continue the uh, video about comparing and contrasting A Journey to the West and Romance of the Three Kingdoms with the Iliad and the Odyssey. And uh, the focal point of today's video is going to be the hallmarks of heroism. That is to say, <clears throat> the uh, traits that both respective cultures sort of pin on heroic figures, the, the elements that constitute heroism, because it's very different uh, from between these two. Let's, uh, let's start with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, the hero is uh, of, of the Iliad is and and this is a little bit more debatable because there are so many heroic figures in the Iliad but uh, the biggest focus is on Achilles when when people think of the Trojan War they think of Achilles Odysseus was present Agamemnon is in in many respects an antagonist character even though he's also not and Paris is an important character and, and, and so forth but but the real focus is on Achilles um, and especially with regard to how unique he is compared to everybody else on the battlefield everybody else is just sort of uh, a regular you know military grunt and, and if they die they die whereas Achilles he is half deity he's a demigod and as such uh, well, in his particular unique situation, he was dipped in a uh, river of eternal life, and as uh, the result, he can't be harmed by conventional weapons except in the one spot where his mother held him when she dunked him in the river, and that is his ankle or his heel, which is why we use the term even now. Somebody's Achilles heel is their, their mortal weakness, their, their fundamental um, way of being undone despite all their other strengths uh, and, and you see this for example this this idea of something being indestructible except for one extremely minor flaw that's that's all over the place in uh, western literature western film and so forth um, a great non-human example of this you know it's it's kinda weird to make a comparison between Achilles and uh, the Death Star in Star Wars but you you don't see this in eastern literature and cinema this uh, uh, it, it's this perfect antagonist, this perfect uh, problem that can't be resolved except through one and usually one remarkably simple m strategy or, or method. And uh, the Death Star is a great example of that. It's this gigantic planet destroying space station. Um, it's, it's basically like a moving castle through space that can just wipe out entire worlds but it has uh, like an exhaust port that's flawed and as such it can be destroyed by one tiny aircraft which at the end turns out to be you know Luke firing blindly and using the force and all that that, that could be a whole other topic because the force uh, in many respects it's it's just Taoism made in space it's, it's space Taoism <laughs> <laughs> Some people think it's space Buddhism, but I think it's more Taoist. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's that's what's interesting about Achilles is he represents, and you see this a lot in in Western uh, narratives. He represents the hero who has blunt force. Uh, that's not a good way of describing it. He's uh, he's bronze. That's what he he sort of represents. Uh, the the Jason Statham kind of hero, the indestructible force kind of hero. Uh, you see that a lot in wish fulfillment stories. You know, John Wick and uh, God of War and, and things like that. Uh, any, anything where a regular person can sort of watch someone who just, uh, they're just indestructible. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's not even just John Wick. Pretty much the vast majority of uh, Keanu Reeves' characters over the past 25 years have been uh, an Achilles type character. Uh, they're in that vein. Neo absolutely would be an Achilles type character. That scene where he's dodging bullets, um, it's not a question of him outsmarting Agent Smith or whoever it was called. It's, it's a question of him having 
an understanding that, that goes beyond normal humanity, that gives him physical um, indestructibility. It gives him physical abilities that go well beyond that of what a normal person should be capable of. And that, that matches Achilles to a T. And that's what Achilles, in many respects, is. He's, he's wish fulfillment. He is uh, this ubermensch kind of character who, uh, no matter what situation occurs, he's not going to be physically bested in any way until the very, very end where, you know, just happens to uh, get shot in the, the heel. And that just, you know, it, it's very conducive to a story where you know that the the one percent chance of something going wrong is going to go wrong like we know the minute we see that the Death Star has a weakness that weakness is going to be exploited the minute you hear about Achilles being immortal everywhere except his heel you know that he's eventually gonna get hit in the heel and uh, and you see this you know time and time again in those kinds of stories and you even uh, you know I, I mentioned Beowulf last time as sort of standing alone but you see something there too it has that one missing scale on the belly which in turn gave rise to Smaug and the Hobbit the this again these these indestructible forces that have one tiny small strangely exploitable weakness um, yeah, and Achilles represents the, that kind of hero, too, at the same time. So you have two interesting elements that you find in Western uh, narratives, but not in Eastern narratives, and that is the 100% brawn character who's, you know, they're, they're physically very strong. They generally don't outsmart anybody, but they, they represent that desire to be strong. Like when you're a little kid and you, you want to be a big, strong man at some point, that kind of desire. I don't think it ever fades. Uh, I mean, even people who reach uh, physical peaks that, that are just astonishing, you know, bodybuilders and athletes and people like that, even they fixate on, on a character who, who represents those ideals well after they've accomplished it because it's, it's something to continue to pursue. Uh, you'll notice if you go to uh, places where there are a lot of people who pursue athletic things and people who pursue um, physical perfection whatever that could possibly mean there's a there's a lot of Superman iconography and Superman is absolutely an Achilles figure he's he's definitely um, a physically indestructible individual and what's his weakness I mean he's a great example as well very exploitable very obvious but you know it's the one thing and that's kryptonite uh, and we use that now. It's kind of funny. That's sort of taken the place, in many respects, of Achilles' heel. You know, what's what's such and such as kryptonite. Uh, and, and then the, on the other hand, we have the clever hero, the the hero who uses their wits to outsmart their foes, and that's Odysseus. Odysseus is constantly using his intelligence, his intellect, to overcome a variety of obstacles. That's another interesting thing is generally speaking when you have the brawny hero that's what I'm going to start calling them I guess the brawny hero and the brainy hero um, they usually have one kind of obstacle and it's an obstacle that can be solved physically. Conversely when you have the the clever brainy hero like Odysseus they're usually up against a real diverse variety of obstacles and that's what makes it entertaining is seeing them uh, overcome them in in a whole slew of different ways, and and that's what I I really liked the Odyssey more than the Iliad for that reason because with the uh, the Iliad all the conflict was just soldiers fighting each other, whereas Odysseus I mean he's got to deal with all these monsters he has to deal with a Cyclops he has to deal with sirens he has to deal with a witch who loves him he has to deal with um, these these douchebags who are basically hitting on his wife over a period of years when he gets back home. He has to deal with a whirlpool monster. Uh, I mean, there's just all sorts of things that he has to contend with, and he has to use his brains in order to do so. The most obvious and interesting one, I mean, Eric Clapton even wrote a song about it, well, inspired by it, would be The Sirens. Uh, he's, he's sailing. The siren songs drive people crazy. Somebody has to be able to hear, to know 
how to navigate properly and give orders, but at the same time, how I or actually know it was to make sure that uh, that once they were out of range of the sirens, I think it's been a long time. Like I said, I read it when I was like 15, but still. Uh, so he volunteers and everybody else plugs their ears with wax, and it's it's just a really interesting example of of. And then he's tied to the the mast and basically driven nuts almost by the, the siren song until they're uh, away from from that threat. And th that's what makes it interesting is whenever he comes up against something, it's not like Achilles. Achilles, that wouldn't work in that situation. You can't just punch the sirens into uh, paste. Uh, you have to use your brain, and that's that's another fundamental thing that we see with. Um, Western characters, and you see this in pre-Odyssey culture as well. I mean, it, I, especially with regard to trickster deities, I think that's what Odysseus has most in common um, with a lot of ancient uh, storytelling is trickster deities or trickster characters, uh, coyotes and ravens in American Indian literature, and foxes in European literature. Those sorts of, which is why we say things like "like a fox," because we're we're comparing craftiness and cleverness to an animal that's associated with those virtues. So, in that sense, the Odyssey isn't the foundation of that idea, but it takes it to a conclusion where it's more human. It's a uh, it's no longer an allegorical idea of cleverness. It's an actual hero. It's a flesh and blood person that can be compared and contrasted to other people, especially to yourself. And uh, that's what makes the Iliad and the Odyssey interesting as a pair of works because the Odyssey is a sequel to the Iliad. Odysseus is trying to go home after the Trojan War and because uh, his men ate the meat for, that was uh, meant to be sacrificed to Poseidon, and Poseidon controls the oceans, he he's, keeps stranding him. He keeps interfering with his um, attempts to go home. And uh, when he does eventually make it, uh, he has to deal with another obstacle. In this case, one that's actually more physical, and that's the interlopers on his marriage. And that's another common thing that you see. It's very rare to have a hero who's a hundred percent just clever and Odysseus has both qualities. Uh, you see this in modern times with for example James Bond. James Bond can outsmart his enemy but when the need arises he can also physically overpower them. You see that with uh, Captain Kirk and other people like that too. It, it's, it's You're more prone to see an, a heroic character who's just strong and not particularly clever much more so than a hero who is a uh, hundred percent clever and incapable of dealing with anything physical because that would be very boring after a time the only exceptions to this would be mystery stories uh, and even that there's usually some kind of supplemental um, ad additional physical prowess like Sherlock Holmes for example he's capable one moment I'm gonna have to pause yeah that was interesting the, the lights were messing up for some reason or another anyway um, yeah it, it would not be very entertaining uh, even Sherlock Holmes for example who's largely a clever a, a Ulysses or Odysseus type character um, he's still physically capable of handling himself he's like a, an expert at boxing and things like that uh, so that's the the chief difference and and that's what you see in modern uh, literature and film and so forth whenever you're you're comparing two heroic characters they tend to fall into those templates they tend to either be uh, the the brainy hero or the brawny hero and uh, I'm about to compare that to the East which is you know vastly different the what makes a hero is completely different let's start with uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, because that's uh, very re really similar to the Iliad. I mean, on on so many levels, um, you have a, a whole slew of heroic characters. You know, it's hard to really pinpoint one antagonist and one um, hero. But generally speaking, I mean, the the person who's constantly praised throughout the work would be Liu Bei, and the person who is constantly 
drug through the mud, which is kind of unfortunate because he, historically he was actually a really great guy, uh, would be Thao Sao. And which is incidentally, I'm pretty sure where we get General South's chicken from. Which I don't think there's actually an association between him and the dish. I think somebody was just marketing, but uh, oh well. Um, but then, in addition to that, I'll probably also touch on uh, Guan Yu and Lu Bu because those are two. They they stand out in some ways more than the actual main hero and main uh, antagonist because they're they're more. They're actually more heroic in, in a lot of ways. They're more physically powerful, and they're they're just really interesting. And that's what makes it kind of harder in that sense, because even though the Iliad had a, a, a real cast of interesting characters, and it's hard to pin down who the, the real hero is, in the case of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it's that much harder. And that's actually an important part of uh, this comparison, because the Iliad and the Odyssey... And you, you can't get more Western than this. I mean, it really does lay the framework for how we look at the world. It's about the individual. It's about Achilles. It's about Odysseus. And when you're looking on the other side, it's about Agamemnon. It's about Paris. It's about uh, Poseidon being slighted. So, so there's a fixation on the individual. Romance of the Three Kingdoms, not so much. Everybody's working as groups. Um, Sao Sao would be nothing without his bodyguard, and uh, Liu Bei in particular. Uh, it's it sort of forms the crux of the Eastern idea, where the individual is sort of, uh, well, not even sort of, absolutely secondary to the group. Uh, you see this. Well, I'll, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Liu Bei and uh, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. Those three individuals, they swear an oath of brotherhood in a peach garden that, that they're all going to die at the same time. And that they're, they're not brothers by blood, but they're, they're brothers in spirit. And their, their chief goal when they make this vow is, is to restore Liu Bei, who is related to the Han, who's been overthrown, the Han Emperor, and, and uh, put him on the throne instead because he has divine right. And that's that's the crux of the conflict throughout the books. Is is Liu Bei wants to be put on the throne because he has divine right. Conversely, Cao Cao does not have divine right, but he's on the throne. And uh, so what you end up with are these three guys looking for other amazing individuals to sort of build an army and fight against Cao Cao and and reclaim the the Han Dynasty. And it's a uh, the, the focus is entirely on the, the way the group works, the harmony. It, it, in the art of warfare, it, it, Tao is actually referred not just to the order of the universe, but it's actually also the harmony with which military units work together. And you see that mentality where you know you don't have a single hero. You have a group of people working in sync together and, and being greater than the sum of their parts. You see that throughout Eastern narratives. You, in particular, I mean, I don't particularly like this genre of entertainment, but the whole mecha genre, the, the Voltron, Power Rangers kind of uh, genre where the, the odds are insurmountable, nothing's working, and then they all sync up together to form a single individual that, you know, is greater than, than just what the individual could do if they acted on their own because they're they're perfectly in sync with one another. That that synergy idea. That's what you see in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It's never like just a one on one conflict. And in the rare instances that it is, it's not Liu Bei and it's not Cao Cao. It's it's usually their retainers or, or other people, in particular Guan Yu and uh, Lu Bu. And uh, Lu Bu is a great example of an antagonist that's, in my opinion, in some ways much more interesting than Cao Cao because he's 100% reckless. He's the strongest person easily out of the entire massive cast of Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But he's young. He's easily persuaded by women who are physically attractive but don't want what's best for him. And he's very quick to betray anybody the minute he gets an opportunity to. So he has no loyalty to the group. 
he, he actually, and it's, I hadn't even thought about it until just now, Lou Bu is raw, unbridled individualism. And that's what makes him such a bad character in that story. Uh, he ends up meeting with one of the worst fates in the story because he betrays people, and he betrays people because he only thinks of himself. He's not in harmony with anyone. Even his adoptive father, um, uh, Jean Duo, I think. Oh man, I gotta re I gotta write these names down so that it's easier to recall. Because I mean, I'm not kidding when I say that there are dozens of characters in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It is extremely difficult to keep up. People tend to, to remember just the three people leading the Three Kingdoms of uh, Sun Jian, Liu Bei, and Cao Cao. But even with that, because it's four books uh, that span, I want to say like 120 chapters, you actually end up with like their kids and then their grandkids fighting. It's, it's insane how many people you have to keep track of. But Liu Bei represents sort of uh, purity uh, and that's that's an interesting thing because you don't see that in the West regarding a hero. Liu Bei isn't very strong. He's not even that clever. He's just morally upright and by being morally upright, by the virtue of being virtuous, he draws powerful people to him and that's what makes him a hero in that sense. He's a leader and you see this in Eastern literature and film, I know I say that a lot, I keep using that exact terminology, but I can't think of a better way to explain it, and, you know, narrative is in sometimes a too broad a word, but you see these stories where someone is, they're generally strong, because in, in modern, especially Chinese cinema, the fight scenes and the choreography are very important, but more importantly, they're good, uh, they're good uh, in accordance to Eastern values. They, they respect their parents and they respect hierarchy and they're very humble and uh, things like that. They're quiet when they need to be quiet and they're loud when they need to be loud and they're passionate about things that are it's important to be passionate about and as such they draw people to them. They draw smarter, stronger people to them who will fight for their cause. That is something you will see consistently in Eastern literature. So it, their hero stories are less about individual power and more about group power and cooperation. And then moving on, and it's a good segue to that, a journey to the West, the main character, it becomes sort of debatable because is it Sun Wukong, the hero of the story, or is it the monk? I mean, really, that's if you've not read it, that sounds like a silly statement. Well, obviously, it's the, the cool one. It's the one that everybody likes. And, you know, nobody thinks of the monk, in many respects, as the main character, but he kind of is. It's really interesting to read because Sun Wukong is Superman, in many respects. Like, he fits that bill. He can do anything. In fact, uh, and I, I would not consider this to be an overly harsh criticism. In many respects, Sun Wukong is the Mary Sueist of all the Mary Sues in any story. There's nothing he has trouble with. In fact, the only conflict that he doesn't directly just perform with, uh, with now breaking a sweat is the one that gets him imprisoned under the Iron Furnace in heaven. Uh, and that's just really so he can meet the monk. That's, that's why he he struggles with that. He's the most powerful character you can imagine. He uh, he can shape shift. He is physically stronger than gods. Like that's actually why he got imprisoned in the iron furnace is because he he started off as a regular monkey. Then he learned how to be immortal. Then he learned how to ride clouds. Then he learned incredible magic, and he gets to a point where he goes to heaven, starts being a dick to the gods starts raising a ruckus because he's a monkey in heaven and uh, he ends up causing so much trouble that all the gods have to attack him at once <laughs> just to deal with him and even then they can't kill him so and, and, and many the reasons why uh, it's such an interesting work in addition to just the fact that it's entertaining to see a, a super powered monkey just beat the crap out of everybody is 
every everything in it there's an esoteric meaning behind it. Uh, monkey represents a lot of alchemical concepts. Uh, in many respects, you could you could actually say that it's so weird to say this though. Sun Wukong, the monkey, he is the eastern equivalent of the philosopher's stone. Like he's a living philosopher's stone. Uh, he's he represents perfection, physical perfection. His his behavior is just uh, it's like a toddler on crystal meth. I mean, he's just out there. But then he ends up meeting this monk. Uh, well, actually being forced by the goddess Guan Yin to accompany this monk to the west to to fetch the the Buddhist uh, scriptures. And what's <laughs> Uh, what's what's so funny about it is the, it, it simultaneously criticized Taoist alchemy, but in many other respects, the whole thing is like a satire of all the Eastern religions. I mean, it really it makes fun of all of them. It makes fun of alchemists as being sort of and, and Taoists in, in particular. I mean, when when pe when you use the word alchemy in the West, it's Christian alchemy. When you use the word alchemy in the East, it's Taoism expressly. It's it's not Confucianism. It's not Buddhism, uh, and it's certainly not traditional uh, Chinese paganism. It's Taoism. The Taoists are always unscrupulous and immoral. They're always awful in a journey of the West. Anytime you come across a Taoist in a journey of the West, it's some creepy old guy who's trying to become immortal, who you know abducts maidens from the village and and takes over temples to use for their own personal gain. They're just immoral. They're just horrible people. But here's the thing. They're capable. They can do things. They're, they're, they often reach immortality and so forth. Uh, on the flip side, the, uh, the Buddhists, represented in this case by the monk, he has never engaged in any kind of sexual promiscuity. He has never eaten meat in his whole life. He was just born this pure being, the monk in, in question. But it also makes him completely incapable of doing anything. Like he has to fetch these scriptures, but he can't. He keeps, he's too naive, so he gets kidnapped all the time. He can't fight back. He is completely powerless. And that's what's interesting is, is the, the Taoists are capable, but they're immoral. And in this case, the Buddhists, they're moral but they're incapable, they're incompetent. And that's what makes the dichotomy between Sun Wukong and the monk, the monkey and the monk, so entertaining because pretty much the whole story, what, what ends up happening is the monk gets into trouble through no real fault of his own and the monkey has to save him, but then the monkey, by saving him, does something horrible, usually really graphically violent and sometimes even sexual and then the monk gets mad and puts sort of sort of punishes him for it and gives him the silent treatment and during that time he gets kidnapped again and so you just have this really funny back and forth where the monk is just he's very weak from from both eastern and western standpoints he's not the remotely heroic he represents all the virtues of a hero, but none of the abilities. And conversely, Wukong, Sun Wukong, he represents all of the abilities that a hero should have, and then some. But he's he's a monkey, and he's not <laughs> he's not uh, decent. He he pisses in the Buddha's hand at the end, and he, he he a lot of times he does things by pissing. It's it's not it's not appropriate. It's not something you can imagine. Uh, Achilles or Ulysses uh, doing at all ever uh, and that's that's what makes that interesting and the reason why it can easily be compared though to Romance of the Three Kingdoms is again it's about this group teamwork without the monk Sun Wukong would have no purpose he would just be a degenerate monkey with superpowers do, doing who knows what probably end up destroying the universe just for fun and then himself by extension, either that or he'd destroy the universe and he'd just be sitting in a void. It would be like the end of that weird Daffy Duck cartoon where he runs out of pages and he's, he's just like on white paper, middle of nowhere forever. Uh, and then conversely, without Sun Wukong, the monk, even though he has the best of intentions, he couldn't get anything done. Uh, 
And that's what makes that an interesting story regarding heroism because everybody loves Sun Wukong. He's the, the crowd favorite. Whenever you see modern adaptations of uh, A Journey to the West, it, the fixation is on the monkey. But in many, in many respects, he's not the hero of the story. The person who has absolute control over him because of uh, Guan Yin, the go Iron Goddess of Mercy's uh, band that she put on him, is the monk. In fact, really, it's the only thing the monk has control over is Sun Wukong. And you see this in Eastern narratives a lot, where it's less about this, these strong heroes, and it's more about the person in charge of these strong heroes. And uh, the, the best example that I can think of would actually be uh, Godzilla, um, because he's this destructive force, very similar to Sun Wukong. He's an animal, he ruins everything he touches, and he's incredibly powerful. But in the more modern Godzilla film, he ins instead saves the day. Well, why does he save the day? Because he's protecting the people. That's that's one of the, the chief reasons he ends up becoming this softer character. Why does he protect people? Usually, he's just sort of thrown into it. But it doesn't change the fact that in, in those stories, no joke, the people of the city being invaded, which is usually Tokyo, they're the monk, and Godzilla is the monkey. It's a, a case of uh, brains and brawn sort of combining. Uh, so instead of a, a single individual hero who's strong and smart and so forth and virtuous, instead you have two characters who have to work together for better or worse and sort of complement one another's weaknesses. It goes right hand in hand with Running to the Three Kingdoms that it's about harmony, it's about working together, it's about cooperation. And uh, you see that a lot in, in Eastern narratives. You see instead of a brainy, brawny character, or a brainy or brawny character dealing with obstacles that can be solved by one or the other, instead you have two working together that uh, it, their cooperation is absolutely necessary without which they wouldn't really be able to get anything done, so they complete one another. So, yeah, that's the chief difference. If you, if you look at uh, ancient Western, um, the foundations for what makes a hero, we think of we think less about virtue, but it is still a fundamental part of it. I mean, nobody wants a hero who's dishonest and unscrupulous and lecherous and, and so forth. I mean, you can have a few vices, but you don't want to be just full-blown degenerate. But the fixation is, is on either their ability to physically take on challenges or use their cleverness to take on challenges. Whereas in the East, it's more about different people with different skill sets cooperating to take on challenges. So in some respects you could say that the that Western culture lends itself to the idea, the model of a heroic character, whereas the East really doesn't. It's it's not about individual individuality. It's it's not there's no single unitary hero in, as part of a story. And even when there is some, you know, incredible macho man kind of character it's usually a very modern take on Western uh, film and literature usually that's what ends up happening um, and, and you see this with uh, you know a great example would be the, the Dragon Ball series which is Journey to the West I mean Goku is Sun Wukong but it's more fixated on him rather than on teamwork and but the reason for that is because the original Dragon Ball was, was kind of like uh, Looney Tunes. I mean, not joking. I mean, it, there, there was a lot of slapstick, and the focus was on Goku being uh, cleverer and smarter, at least with regard to fighting. He's dumb as a bag of rocks when it came to anything else. And then later on, it, it's pretty obvious that the whole thing is either, depending on how you ask, an homage or a shameless ripoff of, of Superman. So... It, it sort of combines the two, but that's why it focuses more on the individual. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've gone on way too long. It's 35-minute video, but that's just the thing to take home is 
you look at the West, you've got brainy characters and brawny characters, and that's those are the makings of a hero, one of the two, as long as you're able to overcome the obstacles that you're facing with one of those two strengths. And then on the other hand, Eastern heroes, Eastern masculinity is based more on hierarchy and cooperation. If you know your place in a society and you do your best at being at that place in society, that's what's heroic. Uh, thanks. Hope, uh, glad, hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, you know try and subscribe and, and maybe ask some questions because you know that's that's the whole point. Thanks.